never shall forget. Now there are some things in life you want to forget. But then there are some things in life I can't forget. Oh, if I was in my Pentecostal church. Some things I want to forget. But there are some things that I can't forget. Oh! Hallelujah. God bless everybody. Those who are viewing by way of webcast, God bless you. This is Better Life Faith Church International, the ministry that teaches you a better way of living. And those of you, if you desire prayer at this time, you can give us a call as the phone number appears across the screen. Or if you would like uh, this service or really any of our services uh, on tape, you can call us and we'll get it out to you as soon as we can. As always, let's welcome this national and international audience. Praise ye the Lord. And those who are viewing, uh, whatever time of day, if you're watching this live now or during the week, today is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. All right. We're going to get right on into the Word of God. And the last few weeks, we've been in this series of teachings of our covenant of wealth. This is what I call volume two. I taught it some years back. But we're talking about our covenant of wealth. Yes, Lord. And our foundation scripture has been Deuteronomy 8.18 where it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Yes. Then I read other translations that says it this way, remember that God, your God, gave you the strength to produce all this wealth so as to confirm the covenant that he promised to your ancestors as it is today. Then another translation says, but remember Yahweh, your Elohim, is the one who makes you wealthy. He's confirming the promise which he swore to your ancestors. It's still in effect today. Then the New Century Version says, remember the Lord your God. It is he who gives you the power to become rich, keeping the agreement he promised to your ancestors as it is today. Then another translation says, he's the one who gives you power to be successful. Then the Common English Bible says, he's the one who gives you the strength to be prosperous in order to establish the covenant he made with your ancestors, and that's how things stand right now. Now, I read all of those uh, translations for a reason. One thing it has in common, it's saying, listen, this, this covenant, it still stands today. Somebody shout, today. Now, we also established that who is this talking about ancestors and what did uh, God promise the ancestors? Well, we have to reach back to Abraham because in the 12th chapter of Genesis, beginning at verse 1, let's go to that real quick. 12th chapter of Genesis, beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to move kind of fast. It says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And then he says, and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I'll make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken. So now there are several promises God makes with Abraham. He's going to make him a great nation. He's going to bless them. He's going to make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. Uh, God's going to bless those who bless you until all families of the earth are being blessed. So Abram departed. And then if you, uh, uh, like I said, I'm going to move fast. In Genesis uh, 13 and 2, it talks about how blessed was Abraham. It says he was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Then in the 13th chapter of Genesis, beginning at verse 14, it says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, 
Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, north, south, east, and west, for all the land which thou see, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then in the 17th chapter of Genesis, verse 6 says, I will make thee exceeding fruitful. I will make nations of thee. Kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant yes. to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now notice in the light of this, it's saying forever. Forever has no exp expiration. Hallelujah. But he's saying, listen, all that that I promised, the promises to Abraham, I've given it to you and to your seed after you. See, the promise was not only to Abraham, but to his seed forever. Yeah. Now the question some might say, well, who is his seed? Well, are we talking about Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and so on? Let's find out. Let's go to Galatians. Galatians. Third chapter of Galatians. Third chapter of Galatians, verse 16, says, now to Abraham and his seed, well, the promise is made, what we just read in Genesis. He saith not, and the seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. And this is very, very important. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, we're not talking about plural, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. But then he goes on to say, this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed, I feel like I'm yelling back there. I feel like I'm yelling, I feel like I'm yelling. All right, praise the Lord. And this I say that the covenant, which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should not make the promise of non-effect. In other words, he's saying before somebody say, oh, that was Abraham and that was the law. No, 430 years before the law. See, what God, this, was, this has nothing to do with law. This was a promise. Now, to save some time, I'm going to read that same passage out of the voice translation. It says, God's promises established a binding agreement with Abraham and his offspring. In the scriptures, it is carefully stated, and to your descendant, meaning one, not and to your descendants, meaning many. Therefore, in these covenant promises, God was not referring to every son and daughter born into Abraham's family, but to the anointed one to come. It says, what this all means is that the law given to Israel comes along some 430 years after the promise made to Abraham. So it does not invalidate the covenant. God previously agreed to or in any way do away with his promise. So what are we saying? What God promised then is still in effect right now. Now if we're in the third chapter of Galatians, let's look down at verse 27. Of verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now here's the catch, 29. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Hallelujah. 
All that, see, it's not just about the stuff. And I've taught years ago, the blessing of Abraham is a material blessing. It's not a spiritual, it's a material. But it's not just about the stuff. But we're talking about the promise. What was promised to Abraham, he says, we are now heirs to that promise. See, in other words, God made the promise, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless you. Then when he takes them out and says, all the land which you see, from the north, south, east, east and west, all the land, I'm going to give it to you and your seed. Then he talks about it as an everlasting possession. Now, I just got on that thing, everlasting possession. See, that's why the devil don't want you to get the land. See, because when you get the land, there is no repossession. There is no evictions. Everlasting possession. And all that Abraham, all what was promised to him, you are heirs to that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See, I'm just telling you, you, you know, just, you just do your own research and just read the life of Abraham and what, what was promised him. Like I say, it's a material blessing. We're not looking at Abraham's spirituality. But all that he promised him, that promise is still in effect today. Now, I know we got to renew our minds on that. I know that. All that was promised to him it was promised to you. If you in Christ, it was promised to you. So I'm an heir. That's why this message is called, we have a covenant of wealth. Has nothing to do with what you did or didn't do. Tell somebody, I have a covenant of wealth. Now, one of the key things we've been saying, if you don't believe you have a covenant of wealth, you're not going to receive it. Now, it doesn't matter it's there. If you don't believe it, you're not going to receive it. And in order for me to receive it, then I have to have that right mindset. And this is what we've been dealing with the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, changing the way you think in order to receive this. Because you can't go any higher than your thoughts. You cannot go any higher than your level of thinking. Hmm. Let's go to 3 John 1 and 2. 3 John 1 and 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper. Now, those who've been following this teaching, we've already established that prosperity or to prosper, it's not limited to finances. You know, that's one thing you have to do. Whenever you hear the word prosperity, people tend to think of uh, stuff. It, it, it's not just, just limited to, uh, what did I say, cash, cars, and condos. <laughs> it includes it. Now, don't get too spiritual. But it's not limited to that. See, to prosper is simply just having success in every area of your life. You know, we don't just talk about prospering financially. You want to prosper. You want to be ha, 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 your health. You want, your, you want to prosper in your health, in your mind, in your relationships, you know. But now the real key to this scripture is as your soul prospers as your mind prospers. Now, we said this before, in the original Greek, this literally means, this word prospers, when it's saying as your soul prospers, it means to grant a prosperous and expeditious journey. It means to lead by a direct and easy way. This word prosper means here to cause to prosper. So now when it's saying, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, but even as your soul prosper, it's basically saying it's going to take your soul to lead you on the journey of prosperity. Mm. 
Mm. In other words, only a prosperous mind can lead you on a prosperous journey. Now, if that's true, I've said this question before, could it be the reason a lot of folk in the body of Christ are not prospering is because their mind is not leading them there. Because you can't go beyond your thinking. You can't go beyond your level of thinking. What I've said for many years, before you get to that next level, you're going to have to first think on that next level. So the determining factor or the key to any level of prosperity in your life is based on your mindset. It's based on your perception, based on your beliefs. It's just based on how you think. Why? Because you can't go beyond how you think. See, the reason most people, and this is anything in life, the reason most people remain, it ain't really a standstill in life. Either you're moving forward or backwards. There's really no such thing as standstill. Either you're doing better or worse. But the reason most people are at a certain place in life is because they've never raised their level of thinking. See, the direction of life is going to be dictated by the domination of a person's thoughts. Because whatever you think about the most, that's the direction your life is going to go in. That's really what Proverbs 23 and 7 is all about. For as he thinketh in his heart or in the mind of his heart, so is he or so he becomes. Because you're going to always move in the direction of what you think about the most. See, I've said for years, the mind is like the control center. The mind is like what, a, the, what, what the thermostat is to a furnace. Whatever you program or set that thermostat to, the furnace, the system is going to respond. If you program that thermostat to cool, the system is going to respond with cool air. If you uh, uh, program that thermostat with heat, then the system is going to respond with heat. So the mind is like the control center. See, your life is going to respond to the programming of your mind. All suggestions in life, they first come through the mind. <laughs> and that's good or bad. Because things don't just happen. There's no such thing as it just happened. To all manifestations, there had to first be a seed. To every reaction, there had to first be an action. There's no such thing as things just happen. <laughs> see, there's no such thing as an effect without a cause. What we see, something caused it. Now, I said this in the first service, and I said good or bad. That's even like sin. You know how some folks will say, you know, Pastor, I don't know how it happened. I didn't mean to. I just slipped into sin. And I've said for years, I, I wonder, what, what does that look like? Is it like, you, like if you slip on a banana peel, like you slip and fall, you just happen, to, you, you, you slip with the reef, you, 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 you slip with the drink, you, you slip in the bed. How does that happen? I'm going to tell you. Let's go to James. First chapter of James. I ain't coming against nobody. I'm just making a point. I'm just making a point. First chapter of James, verse 13. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Now, that's one thing right there. Folks, just, the Lord tempted. No, the Lord ain't tempting you. The Lord testing me. See, the Lord, he purposely put them women's there. And them, no, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. See, we laughing now. I've heard, believe me, over these 30 plus years, I've heard a lot of stuff. The Lord, he was, he was testing me. That, that's why he put that liquor there. No, no. 
So let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin, and when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. So conceived, the conception starts in the mind. See, things don't just happen. It begins there in the mind. Then what does the mind do? It leads you. It leads you and traps you. (laughs) See, in other words, you can't get on a sinful journey unless your mind leads you there. You don't just show up. It led you there. You know, with some things, and you be truth about it, and you know certain things in your own life. Something just all of a sudden happened. And we'll deal with that a little later. A lot of stuff was uncast imaginations. Imaginations we should have cast down, and we didn't. And we left them there. And then uncast imaginations, they don't go away. They grow, and they grow, and they grow. Your mind led you there. Somebody should pay me for that line right there, you know. Hmm. I mean, if you think about it, and we don't have to turn to it, you all know the, the story of the prodigal son. This, his actions weren't something he just woke up with. Somewhere along the line, he thought about that. He thought about, I want to get my portion. His mind led him to ask for it. His mind led him out of the house. And his mind led him to the riotous living. Then eventually his mind led him to be in the pig pen and all that other stuff. But then the Bible says when he came to himself, then his mind led him back home. You see, a person's life is changed when their mindset is changed. See, if your mind ever gets off, guess what? Your life going to get off. Show me a person whose life is out of order, I'll show you that same person whose mind is out of order. Your life as of today is only a reflection of what's been dominating your thoughts. See, it's just like, if you don't like the direction of where your life is going, you know what you need to do? Just change the way you think. If you don't like the direction of where it's going, in order for me to change that direction, I got to change the way I think. Because my mind is going to lead me to a journey. See, none of us just showed up. We were led over a period of time. It's just like what I know today, spiritually and biblically, what I, I, what I know today, I didn't know this 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. But I renewed my mind, and my mind led me to this journey. I changed my poverty mindset into a prosperous mindset. And instead of spending years on that poverty journey, Now I'm on a prosperous journey because my mind led me there. But your mind can't lead you somewhere where it's not. Hallelujah. So now, some may say, well, Pastor, I hear what you're saying, but you're saying I'm where I'm at today because of my mindset. No, I'm going through this because of what somebody else did. Now, I understand our life can be affected by others' decisions. Indirectly, maybe you didn't do anything, someone else did something. Your life can be affected, but, but the truth of the matter is, that doesn't have to be your journey. It doesn't have to be your destination. You know, we can all be affected indirectly by what others do, but that doesn't have to be my destination. I gave the example in the first service 
You know, the widow woman in 2 Kings uh, 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 4. 4 chapter 2 Kings, you know, when her husband died, he was one of the ministers of the prophet Elijah. And, and she said, you know, the, the creditors, they, they've come to take my boys as slaves for the debt. Now, this wasn't her, this wasn't her fault. This was her husband. He should not have left her in debt. Now, that's the message right there, brothers. You know, financial issues should not be, shouldn't really be the, the strain while you lie. Definitely, it shouldn't be the strain if you're dead. Well, some of the women should have really said amen more much loud on that, you know. But this, so now, my, my point is, this wasn't, this, this wasn't her fault. Now, for whatever it is, whatever he did, he was dead, he was gone. They were in serious debt. The creditors come, and, and, and to take her boys to be slaves. But now, what did this woman do? She was not going to allow her husband's journey to determine her journey. So what did she do? Her mindset led her to the man of God. And the man of God gave her instructions on, on, on what to do. Then as a result, <laughs> she ended on a journey of being debt free and living off the rest. So don't tell me because of what somebody else has done, that has to be your destination and your journey. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See, keep in mind what we read in Genesis 1, uh, in the very beginning with, 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 with Abraham. You know, when God told Abraham, listen, get thee out. You know, one translation says, go, go for yourself for your own advantage. You know, get thee out from your family's house, your father. Now, the, now the emphasis is not geography. See, every time I say that, I have to say that because I've seen people over the years run with that scripture, saying, see, that, that's, that's my confirmation, the Lord telling me to go. That is not the emphasis of this scripture. Amen. See, if you don't change your mindset, if you're a fool in Chicago, you will be a fool in Mississippi. Amen. So it's not about geogra uh, geography. Y'all be surprised at the things I've heard over you. That's my confidence. Get thee from my father's house. Get from my family. Get from it's not about ge geography. It's about here. Get away from that thinking that's perhaps not conducive to what God has. Yeah. See, because you've got to understand, Terah, Abraham's father, they were in the idolatry and different things like that. You've you got to get away from that. I, I, I've got some. You've got to get away from that. I've got to get away from everybody who want to stay on public aid. I've got to get away from that. Everybody's saying how sick they are and what runs in our family. I gotta, I, I, don't take a person. I got to get away from that because God has shown me something else. That's the emphasis, not the geography. So any transformation in life is guaranteed based on the change that takes place in your mind. Your thought life will manifest in your everyday life. I gave this report in the first service. They tell us that, uh, 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 that everyone has a negative thought every two and a half minutes. Now, I know we probably never thought about it, and it just depends on how you define negative. But I can believe that. I ain't say you had a, a you know, to some extreme, but, but, but how you define negative. Negative, not positive. <laughs> every two and a half minutes. You know, within the last two and a half minutes, somebody could be sitting here like, I wish Reverend would hurry up. See, that's negative. I wish Reverend would hurry up. That's not positive. So now, every two and a half minutes, negative thought, then that's 24 negative thoughts in an hour. That's 576 negative thoughts in a day. 
And over a year, that's 210,240 negative thoughts. Now, if that's true, we, we can't afford or risk letting our minds get old. Let's quickly go to 2 Corinthians. And the word recognizes that. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse number 5. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Some translation says, Tear down every proud idea that raises itself against the knowledge of God. Philip's translation says, our battle is to bring down every deceptive fantasy. Hmm. See, when it says casting down, casting down, this is not something you wait and do. This is immediate action. You, you've got to do it quickly. Cast down imaginations, those images, those, those pictures, those, those thoughts, because thoughts are things. So you got to get rid of it quick. Yeah. See, because if you let it linger on, it starts turning into something else. I don't know if this has ever happened. You ever had a situation, then it was over with, then you replayed it back in your mind, how you, how you think, how you should have handled it. <laughs> and that's good or bad. You know, you play back somebody told you off, and then you play back in my mind, I should have told them this. Then you think it back how, how it, it could have went, I should have did this. <laughs> See, you got to be careful with replaying back that stuff. See, because those images, see, it, it's like it, it begins as a picture, then you keep going, then eventually it's like a little movie. And you keep replaying that stuff over and over. He says, cast down every image, any image, any picture, any thought that's contrary to what God says. I've seen people over the years who did not know how to handle compliments. You know, maybe there was a little scrub and... and in grammar school, then in high school, oh, they kind of sprouted out a little. And, and I've seen people like that who know, didn't know how to handle that. They get a compliment, that stuff get in their head. And, just, and then they, they just totally just go in left field and mess up. And they should have got rid of that. So you even got to be careful with that right now. People compliment on you, okay, thank you, and that's it. See, if, if you leave that there, so-and-so say, I look nice today. Especially you're married. Now, that's another message for another time. I lost half the audience. <laughs> You got to be careful with that. Does that stuff play in your mind? So and so say, I, if you don't get rid of it, you keep playing and playing it, then you keep seeing them. Then you start dressing for them, wanting them to say something. Then it go back to what I said earlier. Oops, I don't know how to say it. No, oops. Your mind led you there. I don't know where that came from. That was for somebody. Maybe they, this audience is an invisible audience. I don't know. So you got to be careful with any thought that contradicts this or any thought that will, has the possibility of getting you off. Cast it down quickly. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So any contrary thought, whenever it comes up, get rid of it. 
Now, how do I get rid of it? With the word of God. How, do, how does the word of God come into play? I got to speak it. See, you don't replace a negative thought with a positive thought. So I know we do that. We play this mental game back and forth like, like tennis. Positive thought, negative thought. That's not how you do it. You get rid of those negative thoughts by speaking the word. You know, because every time you speak, you stop your train of thinking. I mean, that ain't even spiritual. That's just the fact. <laughs> but that's what Jesus did, if you think about it. Remember when he was tempted, when the devil was tempted? To, and remember, this, this was a confrontation in the mind. This wasn't a, this wasn't a spiritual, but this was, in, this was a confrontation in his mindset. It's not as if the devil was on the mountain taunting Jesus. Temptations begin in the confines of your mind. But what did Jesus do? Every time Satan would say this, aren't you this? And why don't Jesus say, it is written. That's how you cast those, 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 those negative thoughts out. Speak the word. You get a negative thought, I'm so broke out, you speak the word. Hey, wealth and riches is in my house. My God shall supply all my, you, got, you can't sit up there battling thought from thought. You got to open your mouth and say something. See, like I said, because if you don't, those uncast cares or those uncast uh, imaginations, they grow. And then eventually, they become a stronghold. And I've said it before, when you get a mental stronghold, that's when the devil really comes in then. You now bow. And manifestations of those strongholds, now you, there's fear. People get paranoid. Who is that? Somebody follow me. What is that? They don't like me. You got some people paranoid. Nobody like me. That is total paranoia. No one likes you. Somebody like you. The creditors like you. <laughs> so that ain't, that's not true. No one, somebody like you. So that is paranoia. Nobody like me. But see, when that stronghold is there, that fear comes in, that paranoia comes in there, that, that depression comes in there. And we know the ultimate, the ultimate manifestation of depression is suicide. See, things don't just happen overnight. See, that's why every image that goes against what God says, it, get rid of it. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, and one of the things since we're talking about this covenant of wealth, Get rid of all images of lack and poverty. See, this is part of the process of, of renewing our mind. So we we got to get that stuff out of us. You're not going to be led on a prosperous journey and your mindset is still lack. I didn't say what's in your pocket. Remember, the word of God is the highest form of reality. The word of God is what the truth is. It may be a fact you got to have a food stamp in your pocket. But this is the truth. Facts change, not the truth. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So get rid of that, 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 that. Anything that resembles lack. I gave this, I said this in the first service, really. One of the simple things some of us need to do is go home and get rid of half the stuff in our closets. That's a start. And when I mean get rid of it, throw it away, not give it to somebody. You don't sow something you don't want into somebody else's life. Because whatever you sow, you reap. Now, that's another message right there. I've known some folks. I, I, they, they die, I, they, I give stuff away all the time. You, you giving away that junk. And then that's why you keep getting junk back. Uh, 
Oh, I done lost about 40% now with that. See, I'm talking about putting your, get, getting your mind together because your mind is what's going what's to lead you. If your mind is not together, you're not getting on that journey. And some things, some of us just start getting on anything that looks like poverty, get rid of it. I said for years, some stuff is stuff broken in your house, either get it fixed or throw it away. See, you don't never want to get used to having broken things. Because it come, becomes acceptable. You want to get it fixed, get rid of it. And some of us need to just start, just, just start that, just get, rid, get rid of some of this stuff. Now, you, you, you've proven that you've had it over generations because it was in style in the 70s. It went out of style in the 80s. Then it came back in 2000. Then it, we, we understand. We get it. But that's just, those are just my favorite gym shoes. And most stuff that's our favorite, they are so worn out. They, I know we got a connection to it because it smells like us. <laughs> now, I'm being somewhat humorous, but I'm being truthful. Until this change, you ain't going anywhere. You know, depending on where you're at, every now and then, I ain't saying all the time, you know, you, we all got to grow into this. I'm not telling anybody just instantly do stuff. But every now and then, some, sometime, one side of the year, don't, 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 don't always look for the sale. Just once out of the year, one time. I didn't say week by week, just once, just once. Just one time. Don't bring the coupon. Just one time. I didn't say for everything. Just one item. Just one time. Some folks be holding the line up. No, I ain't coming against nobody. Certain things, hey, I've been there somewhere. But there are times I've been in line because I was ready to go. I, I, let, me, let me pay for it. Don't worry. Take, take your stuff. Take it. Take, take, use it next time. I got to go. Let me pay the extra. So I can go. Amen. I done lost 60% of you all on that one. I don't care who you are from the pulpit to the back door. You are not going to get on this journey until it's here. Not going to happen. Because your mind is what leads you to every journey. Oh, gosh. Now, once again, this is how the mind works. There are four manifestations of the mindset. Your will, your emotions, your intellect, in your imaginations. I'll say that again. Your will, your emotions, your intellect, and your imaginations. And this is really what, what, what makes the mind like the control center. In other words, I, 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 I need to have my will, my emotions, and my intellect, and my imaginations all in sync in order for me to, to, to uh, 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 be led on this journey of prosperity. I need them all to, to, to work in together, to, to, to be on this journey of this covenant of wealth. You see, in other words, even though it's the will of God, with any of God's promises, even though it's the will of God, but is it your will? I mean, we know it's the will of God that you be healed, but is it your will? We know it's the will of God that you be delivered, but is it your will? Now, if we've been established, it's the will of God for this covenant of wealth, or for you to prosper and help, but is it your will? 
See, what makes the mind the control center, part of that, the will is so strong. There is nothing or no one that can go against your will. God will even never go against your will. Because that's one of the gifts he gave us, free will. That's why he says throughout scripture, whosoever will, let him come. God is not going to force you to do anything. I know people say, God may, no, God don't force you to do anything. Then he would be stripping you of your will. If that was the case, then God would make everybody saved. But in the book of Peter, he says, listen, he wished that no man uh, uh, would perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we know that's not going to happen. So God won't even come against your will. And we know the devil doesn't have power to come against your will. So in that mindset is your will. So this has to become my will. Then you have to always keep your emotions in check. See, because we know, and I've been that, that lack in poverty, that thing will try to creep in and manipulate your emotions. Well, nobody, they know I'm going through. Well, somebody help me. The church talk about some building fund. We talking about giving away 300 baskets, and they been in my cabinet. See them, them, <laughs> them emotions will manipulate you. So you got to keep them in check. Your intellect has to comprehend that you are an heir to the blessing of Abraham. You got to comprehend that. That's right. See, just like you've comprehended that you say, I'm sure most of you have been saved, especially for some time, there is no, nothing anyone can tell you otherwise that you're not. If nothing else, you know you used to, like, I know I'm saved. I don't care what you say. I know I'm saved. Because it has, con- you, I, don't, I don't, but get out of my face. I know I'm saved. And nobody can tell you otherwise. Because the intellect has comprehended it. I'm telling you, I always felt that way. Hey, if anybody going to heaven is me. Now, I like to believe y'all say. Well, the only person I do know is moi. If anybody going to heaven, I's going. So your intellect has to, to comprehend, comp- comprehend it. Then you have to get that image of prosperity within you. In other words, you have to envision yourself prospering and living in your covenant. Now, once again, we're not just talking about stuff. Because those of you who've been with me some time, you know that we're blessed to be a blessing. See, one of the things you, envi- you envision blessing people. I ain't talking about with some hand-me-down stuff you don't want. I'm talking about really blessing people. I ain't talking about no ham sandwich. Envision. You know, blessing cities, nations. See, I'm talking about helping the real poor. See, see, now let me say something. I ain't saying we don't have certain poor in America, but it ain't what, see, see, our definition of poor is not really what it is. The real poor is devi- defined as those who lack resources, not those who just don't want to do. Most of us, if you ain't been out of this country, you don't really know what real poverty is. When you have no access, no resource, there aren't any water wells. Not just because mm, they turned my water off. No. They wouldn't have turned it off if you would have paid the bill. I ain't talking about low. I'm just, I'm just low. You, no, I'm talking about no resources. 
See, a lot of us, even if we get low, we have some options. There are some people have no options. Now, before somebody choke me, what do you mean option? You know, you, know, you, you got an option now. If your phone get cut off, the government can give you one. I was at a funeral a couple years ago. I'm looking at all these guys busting out their, now don't strike me down, busting out their government phones. They comparing, and I'm looking like, what? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I ain't coming against you, I'm just making a point. Options. Real poverty, there aren't any options. There aren't any resources. So sometimes we have to be careful. Some people say, I help the poor all the time. Oh, really? To really help the poor, you got to have something. Now I lost 85% now. The real poor. And that's why we have this, have this covenant well. It's not for your four and no more. And I've said this for years, so you can be a blessing, a real blessing. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful? I'm saying something very simple. You can be driving along, Spirit of God tell you, you know what? Drive down to 16th Street. And then you driving down 16th Street, and you see the sheriff putting somebody, putting a family out, out with some kids because the single mother she just got fired and she just she didn't do nothing foolish she didn't spend the light money on getting her, her nails done it just got real rough and she could but then the spirit of the lord leads you down 16th street and you go there and you can tell them stop can i pay her rent for one year Or if they say, no, it's too late, that's all right, sister. You know what? We're going to get you a place. But in the meantime, let's take you and your kids to Trump Tower downtown until we, f I didn't say Motel 8. A real, that's how I say, a real blessing. That's what I'm talking about. See, sometimes I have to inject that so you can really receive this message and it don't sound like a selfish message. I'm telling you, I, 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 I've, I've been around people, been in prayer lines praying for people and the Spirit of God spoke to me one time I was at a church and spoke to the woman and said, you know, that God wants to give a promotion and she said she don't want one. Now, my flesh wanted to pull her wig off, you know, but, but I, can't, I can't do that. You know. Can't do that. She's just satisfied. And I ain't coming against her. She just don't know. But see, when you just think about your foreign no more, that's one of the most selfish things a Christian can ever do. To become content with, I'm just happy where I'm at. As long as I can pay my bills, I'm, that is so selfish. Because you're getting away from the mandate of going into all the world to preach the gospel. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So you get, got to get that image, that envision, prospering and living in your covenant. Now, what does it take to get my mind to where it needs to be? Quickly go to Romans 12. Oh, gosh, I got about six minutes. Romans 12. Many of us know this. Twelfth chapter of Romans. Hallelujah. Twelfth chapter of Romans. I know I had it in here. Praise God. Let me get my back. Romans 1, 1 says what? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Prove that what is acceptable will, will of God. I guess, I guess I remember. Yeah. 
Don't be conformed to this world. In other words, this word conform means to be molded or shaped. And most of us, we've, we've, we've been conformed to a certain way of thinking. How we were raised, life experiences, or whatever. But he's saying, don't be conformed, don't be molded or shaped uh, uh, to, to the world's way of thinking, but be ye transformed by the renewing. This word renew means to renovate. And always the example I like to give to uh, renovate, it, it means like to just gut out. You know, those of you who know anything about construction, if we were to renovate this room or gut out this room, everything in here would be removed. You would just see a shell of, of, of this room. No carpet, no drywall, no nothing. Just rent. And that's what we have to do with our mindsets. See, that, 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 that's the only thing that will cause the transformation. See, we're not talking about having a changed mind. We want to be transformed. There's a difference in change and transformation. Perfect example is, 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 is a caterpillar. A caterpillar does not change into a butterfly. A caterpillar is transformed. See, see once he's, that caterpillar is transformed into a butterfly, it no longer can turn back into a, butter, to a caterpillar. See, because sometimes you could change one, you change back. We want a transformation. You know, the born again experience is a transformation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become, it's a transformation. Hmm. So now, as I'm going through this process with re renewal, and once again, how do I renew that matter? I got to use the word of God. Let's go to Joshua 1 and 8. Joshua 1 and 8. Joshua 1 and 8. Joshua 1 and 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, most of us, we already know the power of meditation. Meditation on the Word of God is designed to change your believing system. You know, it, 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 when, you, when you meditate on something, and it is, it, it's in that mindset too, it's, it, it changes how you believe. In other words, we all have a set point in us. Uh, 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 and, and, and in order to change that set point or change that programming, we've got to put the Word of God within us. You know, this is what we call, if you all remember, I, I, I taught more on that mind of the, uh, the conscious, the conscious and the subconscious. See, when, you, when you're trying to really get that change and that, that transformation, you got to go in that subconscious. Change that program. Because we all have a program. We all have a set point in us. We all think a certain way. You know, if something happens, we all respond the same way based on that programming in us. You want a different response, you got to change that set point. You know, it's just like a person uh, who has that set point. Every time they get a headache, they look for an aspirin. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. Don't misunderstand me. But if that set point is in you, every time you get a headache, you, you're looking for an aspirin. But if you change that set point, that instead of me looking for an aspirin, I'm, I'm going to say the word of God. you got to change that set point and start doing that. Then if that time comes up, headache comes, you ain't looking for an aspirin. What a word. You start speaking the word. You know, if you get lack in your finance, many of us got a set point, we know who to call to loan us some money to the fifth. I'm not coming against that. And that's what you'll always do if that's that set point in you. And you may try other stuff because you hear Reverend preaching on Sunday, this or that, but if that set point is not changed, you will try to obey the word, but remember, it's like it's a rubber band in you. You will try to do right, but then that rubber band will pull you right back. So you change that set point. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See, because that subconscious mind, it, it's designed to keep you from changing. It's like a comfort zone. It don't want to change. Believe it or not, some folks don't want to change. See, because Jesus said, to whomsoever much is given, uh, 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 much is what? Required. Some folks don't, they don't want no more because they don't want to be required to do more. 
Some, like, some folks like that for and no more, and that's it. Some folks would okay as long as I get my check on the first and the third. That's it. Now, you would think that some folks, they don't, they don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to, I, I, I don't want, because I, I don't want nobody messing with my Section 8. I don't want nobody messing with my benefits. See, you all laughing. You'd be surprised. There are some folks you could say, you know what, I give you a million dollars right now. And they go, yeah. Then they'd be thinking, let me think. Let me think. Because then they think, I wonder would that mess with my stamps? <laughs> we laughing. I'm telling you the truth. I know some folks still marry. They hate each other. Hate each other. But if they divorce, they lose the benefits. Didn't Johnny Taylor make a song? It's cheaper to, see, y'all ain't saved. Y'all are not saved. Y'all said that so fast. It ain't cheaper. I'm miserable. Forget that. That's another message for another time. But I'm just telling what the mindset of some folk is. Oh, gosh, I got one minute. So now, in order to change your mindset, you've got to, Pull up all roots of poverty and lack. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. And poverty and lack is not a tree that God has planted within you. So I've got to plant another tree. And I tell you next week, because I'm out of time, those of you who have been viewing this by way of webcast, God bless you. We'll see you this coming Wednesday, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time for Better Life Lessons. Come on, let's thank God. Woo, hallelujah. Come on, thank God. Thank God, thank God. Tell three people, I've got a covenant of wealth. I've got a covenant of wealth. I've got a covenant of wealth.